Hello everyone, nice to see you through the camera. Uh, I'm Julian, I'm the product manager of my Taiwan tour. Um, it's a pleasure to see you here and I would like to give you a quick brief of why the topic is called sustainable tourism. Um, I used to have this um, master degree in Austria, um, where you know the, the capital called Vienna in Central Europe. There, sustainability is such a big word that everyone is discussing and, and trying to implement it in a better approach. So um, out there, we got a lot of um, ideas of how other countries are doing, and then get back to Taiwan. After so, we also started to um, practice a sustainable approach in here, my country. So today, the talk about the agenda of today. So first of all, I will not just start from the definition, but I would like to give you an idea, like why do we talk about this? Uh, because, you know, I remember I have like a few classmates from Haiti, from uh, Costa Rica, from um, Central America. When we talk about sustainability, we kind of find it really um, like naive, let's say, because we can, also say, oh, there's only people in a better economical situation can take care of sustainability while we people still worry for harvesting, right? But um, that's not exactly true. So here I would like to share you uh, an, an idea of developing country. Um, when they change their policy to sustainability, they also have good work out. And then, of course, we still have to talk about serious definitions by some models, some, some, some like theories. But then we'll talk about case studies that will echo the theories. And the case studies, I pick few cases from the worldwide, from the national scale to the individual scale. And um, of course, I would like to take up some cases that we implement in Taiwan. And there is a really interesting case that not only implementing in Taiwan, but also Japan called Satoyama Initiative, number five in the agenda. And least, uh, last not the least is the solution, like how are we going to implement sustainability in our life, in our work and in tourism. Okay, so let's jump to the first topic. Okay, why do we have to talk about sustainability? If I assume you work in tourism, you probably would have the most important question, like why do tourists choose us, right? Like Taiwan, such a little country, uh, like, you know, nobody can really point it on the map. Uh, here we have a theory, which is called tourist behavior. Tourist behavior from the right side is the final stage, but we have to look at the left side. It starts from the tourism destination image which means you certainly have an impression of a place. So if you have never been to Taiwan, never heard of Taiwan, you probably have no impression of this place and you will certainly not uh, make a trip planning, inviting your uh, mother or father, brother or sister, yeah? Uh, unless you're a explorer, an adventurer. Most of the people, they would rather to choose a destination with a certain impression. Let's say if you want to travel with your the other half for honeymoon, you probably will say, I want to go to Paris. But you've never been to Paris. You don't check news in France. How would you know what exactly they happen there if people are so romantic as always? That's probably not always true, yeah? But you have this impression and that leads you to the next stage. That you started to have a, a network, then I say, like you started to plan for this. Okay, we must see uh, this 10 places in, in, in Paris, we have to go to this restaurant, da, da, da. and then all of this planning probably will satisfy your trip with your the other half. And then you will do this most important stage uh, in the consumer uh, pattern, which is buy the ticket. Yeah, so that's so called the intention of behavior. So through all of this, um, what a DMO uh, or a tour operator try intrude is the middle part. Let's say the, the multi-attraction travel behavior pattern. Yeah. So that's uh, the, 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 the place that we can intrude the most. But most of all, you need to have this impression of the place, right? So as a destination, we ask ourselves, what kind of impression would I like to have for tourists worldwide? And um, 
here I would like to present you an idea of the mo the happiest country on earth. What might it be? I asked several people, and everyone tell me the same answer called Bhutan. Probably Bhutan, you don't know how to spell it, you cannot really point it out on map, but you can tell me that's the happiest country you probably heard. Isn't it an amazing, successful destination impression? Yeah, so this is a video taught by the, 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 the previous politician in Bhutan that focused on uh, sustainability. He tells you a story like how and why they do sustainability in the national scale. And then how ha did it happen? And what should you do in this TED talk? It's a 19 uh, minutes talk uh, video. I'm not sure how far I can uh, provide this uh, video playing here, so I shoot you this uh, capitals. Might you uh, might you have the interest? You can type it in Google and look for this video. So I just want to say, as a developing country, it's such a small, small country that beneath China, above India, the most you know the, the most populated countries on earth. For this such a little place, they built a great impression, and they still earn a tons of money from tourism, but in a better way. So just in the first idea, why we talk about sustainability? Um, hope you get more interest to follow the next two hours talk. Yeah. Um, so that's normally what I say to the Taiwanese tour operators. Let's make Taiwan as the most, uh, the greenest island in East Asia, because probably there is no. For your country, no matter your Palau, your, your, your um, any kind of country that you are all, we are all stated in this North Pacific Ocean. So we all have this potential to call ourselves the greenest island in Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Okay. Then here we go to the definition of sustainability. Here is my favorite sentence, um, which presented in 1980s. 87 uh, in this report called Our Common Future by UN. So that's so-called 30 more years ago. We already have this idea of sustainability, but see how far it is for us to um, still experiment in uh, this topic. It takes a while. So development that means the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. Sounds a bit long, then maybe make it shorter. If you have a baby, you don't want your baby to suffer. The world is already becoming more and more warm and unbearable. You probably don't even want to have a kid. But just to give you an idea that you don't want to have more burdens, like for the next generation, is the core concept of sustainability. So here I don't need to address more of sustainable travel, right? Um, as a tourist, as a stakeholder in tourism field, you don't want to have more burdens for the environment, you don't want to have more burdens for the locals, um, just because you're having a vacation. That's the whole idea of sustainable tourism, which was far, far from um, the original vacation idea that people have, right? It's always luxury hotels, cruise ships and oh, what I want to have is I'm having a vacation satisfy me. No, it's no longer the more the better, but more sustainable, <laughs> more adequate, more um, seizing the golden moment, the better. Okay, and uh, here I just give you a, a picture that you might uh, often see called CDG, SDG, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. It's presented by the UN to have an urgent call for everyone on Earth. Urgent call means like we have to do it now or we should do it together. Otherwise, we can never fulfill the 17 factors. Uh, no, nevertheless, we all live on this Earth. So look into um, those 17 factors to a easier understood pattern, which is called uh, three circles that motivate a, a positive circle for this environment, uh, including the, the, the nature, environment, um, economic, 
and uh, community. We can also call it society. So, like looking through the same pattern, right? The, the three and compose a circle. Here you can easily find your own position. Uh, take myself as an example. I am a tour operator, so I stay on the top of the triangle. I manage the economic. That's what I look for. But if I want to look for sustainability in this circle, I will take care well of the society and the environment, which means um, I would certainly choose carefully of my suppliers. They have to be the people who are so passionate for the earth, uh, who take care also of their employees, um, good, good, good materials, good ingredients, um, fertilizing uh, with natural resources. Environmental wise, I will probably manage um, less than uh, trash produced through the whole tour, less plastic, um, like more um, reusable energy, so on and so forth. So for you as a tourist, probably, you can also find yourself, you know, you, you, you boost the economic, right? You, your payment is a, is a vote for the locals. But in the meanwhile, you can choose a better um, local suppliers, right? So you don't choose um, like McDonald's. I, I, I mean, I can probably frankly just say it here. Uh, you rather choose uh, farmers, uh, local farmers using um, local ingredients, um, fertilizing um, well for the for the earth, and provide you fresh food. So that's a responsibility from a tourist. So um, if you're a farmer, you probably instead of a tourist, you probably stay at the right side of the triangle. You take care of the environment, but in the meanwhile, need the money. So, right? so you, you all still need this business uh, behavior through economic, but in also have to take care of the society to have more laborers to work for you. So here's the idea that you should always keep in mind when we talk about sustainability, always three circles. Do I take care of all of them when I make this decision? Yeah. And um, then you will say, huh, I heard of sustainable tourism, but there are also a lot of terms out there, like ecotourism, responsible tourism, I just mentioned, uh, so something called green tourism, I, I don't see here, but you know, I probably heard of it. So um, are they all sustainable tourism? The answer is yes. Why? Because we say we don't want to give people more burdens. So whoever have this idea, uh, this concept, like taking care of everything, right? We don't have to like strain ourselves so much and, and put in this term in the right definition as long as you're doing it right. Sustainable tourism, okay? Um, still, you might ask me then what exactly is the difference in between eco tourism and sustainable tourism? Um, here I still give you the broad idea of the circle. So you see um, down up there, it's wildlife tourism, which means uh, it, it can be a, a national protected park. And the, the, the far you leave from the national park to uh, the entrance of the national park and to the closest market of national park, you probably will be the natural based tourism, right? And that's still really close to wildlife. And then, you know, I, smart as you are, I think you can understand what I mean. So I like my Taiwan tour, we don't do, we don't only focus on uh, like hiking, diving, cycling. So we don't call ourselves an ecotourism travel agency. We more call ourselves like sustainable travel agency because we through um, selection suppliers, um, training of the locals, uh, through those approach, we keep our promise and sustainability but uh, we're not like always taking our customers to the nature. So just give you an idea that like the, the little difference in between these two terms, yeah? And um, okay, the next part is that, so here are some ugly facts. If you find the models and the theories don't convince you enough to face sustainability as an urgency, uh, here are some reasons you might like to hear. Uh, first of all is the carbon footprint from your left upside photo. 
since 2009, the aviation, the flights, you know, numbers, uh, the flight numbers are, the companies are more and more like rapidly increasing. That caused a serious carbon footprint issue. So just giving you an idea uh, of how polluted the, 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 the tourism field is. Um, in the whole world, there are 5.3% of CO2 emission comes from tourism. Inside of tourism field, 72% um, comes from transportation. Inside of 72%, 55% comes from the flights, the aviation. So if you, as a daily life, your food, footprint, carbon footprint is like one, you take a flight, it jumps to 100. So that's just a fact. And um, the other hand, that's um, check through the, the cruise ship you see from your right hand downside. That's a serious example of uh, carbon footprint once again. Why? Because um, for the carbon footprint, the cruise states like um, like cr crazy example. So estimation, like averagely, each cruise they need 150 tons of fuel a day. How much is a 50, 150 ton? That is a million uh, automobile each day and whenever you jump into the cruise you triplize your couple of print so on, on, and in your daily life it's one and you jump into the cruise it's three and not to mention all the trash right after your party after your dining all the trash to be honest go through this ocean because there is no police of ocean it's so easy for the cruise company to just drop it in, earth, in, in, in the ocean. And the worst of the worst is the, the there's a certain level of their emission is the, the nitrogen oxide, and that causes um, the AC rain. And that's why there are a lot of scientific proof um, to say the cruise is uh, unavoidable reason of the rapid growth of disease such as cancer. And um, the other thing recently happened is the the human right of the cruise laborers, because most of the employees, unless you're the official employees, if you're a part time, then uh, you basically don't have this lowest wa uh, wage, the, the the promised wage, which means you can you ha always have to look for tips, and that doesn't make you always happy. And uh, during this pandemic period, people just have. Uh, all the customers they they were um, left they left from the cruise right like for, before the the after the, the the check however the labors they were still inside of the cruise and probably until now so the discrimination of the human right or the work right in cruise company is horrible and um, so the other thing is uh, you will see the, the the upper part from the cruise is over tourism. So uh, this is a photo of Valsiaga in, in Spain that is just everyday life in their summer. Um, just imagine if you go to work and you don't look, you, you can't look for a bus because it was always occupied by, by, by tourists, you might not be too happy. Yeah. So there's always a balance like in between the, the, the capacity of, 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 of tourists and the capacity of locals. And uh, the last one, okay, so it's a, she's a sexual worker in tourism field. So it's a sad truth that in Central America and uh, part, several countries in Southeast Asia, there are still a lot of cases like this one, especially uh, girls under 16. And none of us would like to see our girls, ladies, uh, sisters working in this field. So, um, all of these reasons were dressed uh, clearly in this book called Overbooked. Uh, it is a book published in 2013 by Elizabeth Baker. She is a journalist of New York Times. She spent 10 years investigating an ugly truth behind tourism field and down to this book to um, dress the awareness 
in the world. Like, hey, we really have to take seriously of this industry. It's just, it's not an industry that people having fun, having vacay, and we just don't take care of the rest of all. No, because it's highly relevant to everyone's life, right? From the air you you, you breathe in to the kids that you take care. Of. So um, here's a video for you that she had a, like a, like a long speech. And I would like to show you um, of, of the content that she had here and might cause your interest to take into this book. And after this video, we will take a short break. My friends, I was investigating the tourism industry. They thought it would take a few months. That's how quickly you have um, skyrocketed to the top. Um, the clues are pretty much everywhere. If you notice, we just had this horrible shutdown in, in the United States of our government. And the only sector that got special permission to reopen was tourism. Five states convinced the federal government to let them reopen their national parks because October was such an important tourism time. And then look at Europe. In Europe, tourism sector was responsible for pulling a majority of those countries who were so indebted out of their problem, Spain just this summer. And I don't know if you notice it, but Greece, the private citizens, including Greek Americans, paid millions of dollars, collected and paid millions of dollars to put up billboards to invite people to come back as tourists. So you all are very, very powerful. But I would argue today that you're not using your power and particularly an organization like yours, um, has a voice that needs to be heard. Um, give you a couple examples that you all know very well here in um, Costa Rica. You're filling a void that I don't think has been recognized. For instance, medical tourism here in Costa Rica. The United States, as you know, is going through our medical, a new medical law. And by default, the tourism industry around the world, their ministries of health with their ministry of tourism, has filled that void, offering trips, particularly for Americans, but other people, to go to a country where they can get medical treatment for a small fraction of what they would have paid in the United States and gotten a great holiday out of it. You're doing that. You're fall falling into the void for environmental problems, particularly in the United States. And um, I don't see you sitting at the table of the big decision makers. So I hope in these few minutes I can explain to you that at this moment in history, when you're at such a crossroads, you have a voice and it's your, your, um, your right and your responsibility to take it. Now, when I looked at the history of tourism, first I found there wasn't really a history. In 20 years, just 20 years, you all have skyrocketed to this top position. And why? Well, the answer is sort of obvious, but it took a while to figure it out. The Cold War ended. The Cold War ended, and half of the world was suddenly open for tourism. That's huge. That means most of formerly, well, most of Asia, China, Southeast Asia, most of Eastern Europe that have been cut off, even now, finally, Cuba was suddenly open and that multiplied, doubled how you, where you could travel. And then secondly, there was a big innovation in how you could travel. Airplanes can now fly across half the globe without stopping. Then of course we know about the internet revolution. Since um, the Cold War ended in, in the early 1990s and all these countries opened at the same time, we've all of a sudden got the World Wide Web, which made it easier to find the trip a reduction in costs, and, of course, the rise in the middle class. Now, to tell this story in my book, which I love to show the cover, overbooked, um, I, um, I looked at you all, your industry, in terms of cultural tourism, consumer tourism, nature tourism, and then the two giants, China and the United States. And it took me about two seconds to realize that my book on nature, my chapter on nature tourism had to start with you all. Um, and that's why it's so much fun to be here. Um, I'll start with you and then I'll move to France, which was the other. I'm just gonna give you the good examples. 
Um, you all know who you are, where you came from, the importance of getting rid of the military. I've heard that about five times in the last 24 hours. Um, and you all convinced me that good tourism reflects the character of a country. I'm, I'm really pleased that the person who follows me is the daughter of Gerardo Budowski because he's one of the people I, I spotlighted as a pioneer in your tourism. And it's no accident that you have your previous president, President Arias, was, won the Nobel for um, ending the war in 1987 in your neighbor, Nicaragua. You know all the ups, but you've had a few downs. Um, you went through that period where they, the historians called the hamburgerization, where you almost lost a lot of your ecotourism because you're cutting down so many forests. And then, because of the way the global system works now, you almost lost it to a trade rule. Do you remember CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement negotiations? That's the first time I ever heard of ecotourism and Costa Rica because I was covering it for the New York Times and all of a sudden um, Costa Rica refused to sign the agreement. Nobody ever does that in Washington. No country says no. So I go over to the embassy and say, what's the problem? Well, one of the main problems was this trade agreement would have opened up a lot of your um, preserves to uh, American hotels, and your government said no, and whoa, that, that told me there was something going on here. Um, and that's where you, with your, in, with your um, background, will be able to tell other countries where they need to go and, and how to go there. France was my other good example, and they are cultural sphere more than natural sphere, but they are leading the way in saying no to the non-sustainable city types of, of tourism. They're interesting because, like you, their sustainable tourism grew out of their character. They were the first country to have a ministry of culture. What does that have to do with tourism? It sustains the society. They're the first country in the world to have paid vacations, 1930s. What does that have to do? It means people have the ability to travel. And finally, they are um, bureaucratic enough that they look at tourism as a holistic experience, which is the piece that you all understand. They have a Ministry of Transportation working with the Ministry of Culture, Tourism, Commerce, all to make sure that tourism is bottom up, that a society decides what will work for the society and that will bring the tourism, not vice versa. So those help explain the oddest thing I found in my research. France is the number one destination in the world. It's smaller than our state of Texas, yet it draws more people from around the world than big China, big, big Australia, big the United States, you name the country. And why is that? Because they said tourism will be giving foreigners the experience of France. So all those jokes you hear about the arrogance of the French and you know, how standoffish they are, in fact, that was the guiding principle. And I think it's, the, I feel the same thing here in Costa Rica, that we are becoming as French as we can. We're not going to be a homogeneous where every hotel looks the same and every garden looks the same and every amusement park looks the same. We are going to be as French as we possibly can. And that has made tourism their number one sector. Now, they don't talk about it much, which is, goes back to the sense that tourism still hasn't given its, taken its full position in the world, but tourism drives everything in that country. Go a little further afield, Africa. We have um, experience in Africa where the, the tourism sector is going to help uh, reunite African cultures with their game park cultures and help preserve an environmental treasure for the whole planet. I saw there an unusual site of American philanthropists putting their money into African parks um, because they feel that the most precious thing left on this planet is wildlife, flora, and fauna. And uh, for instance, I went to Zambia, 
to a park there, one of the largest parks in the continent, and gorgeous. I, I, it was knocked my socks off. It was so amazing. And I said, how do you finance this? And they had an angel, and this is what, you know, an anonymous donor, and it turned out to be Paul Allen, who with Bill Gates was the founder of uh, Microsoft. The reason he did that and another philanthropist named Greg Carr is saving a huge park in Mozambique is because they say, we have to do more than just save a park, we have to give it life. And tourism to them was the answer. Tourism monetizes it, that horrible world, word that you will hear all the time in, in the industry is that tourism gives a chance to earn some money from preserving the planet. And it also brings life so that local populations, local um, cultures, and local societies can enjoy this. So in Africa, I saw this working with governments, working with local communities to try to find the balance. It's very hard, and it's really easy to give up. And I also met some people who gave up a lot. Um, but within the um, within that structure, you find nature and culture working well. It doesn't always work well. And even though this is a very uplifting conference, I have to mention a couple of things where it doesn't work well at all. Um, the, there are two passages in my book that have um, been pointed out a lot. The first is about you all saying, and I hope you, you keep, keep me an honest woman by keeping up with your ecotourism. <laughs> but teeny little Costa Rica, I point out in the book, to this day, Costa Rica can boast a stunning diversity of flora and fauna in a country slightly smaller than the state of West Virginia. Costa Rica has more species of bird than the United States and Canada combined, more butterfly species than the entire continent of Africa, and is a biological superpower boasting 200 reptile species, 200 mammal species, and an astonishing 35,000 insect species. And people say that's impossible. Now on the bad side, I talk about um, the fastest growing sector of the tourism industry, which is cruise ships. Um, cruise ships are, um, are polluting the ocean, and I read this one paragraph about just what happens in one day in the life of a cruise ship. According to the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States, in one day, a cruise ship produces 21,000 gallons of human sewage, one ton of solid waste garbage, 170,000 gallons of wastewater from showers, sinks, and laundry, 6,400 gallons of oily bilge water, et cetera, et cetera. Those are two phases of your industry. And against, in order to support your, the, the better half of your industry, you have to be able to distinguish yourselves, right? And that will be part of this conference. Um, you have a, a, one of the founders of the Global Sustainable Tourism Council is here. And that's the certification that um, I followed during my, the course of my work. And needless to say, I wasn't surprised that one of the leaders of that is a Costa Rican woman named Erica Harms. And if you live in a country like the United States where it took 20 years just to get an organic label for food, you know that your tourism business will rise and fall based on your ability to distinguish the good from the bad. And then at the end of my book, I talked about the two giants, China and the United States. Remember I said France was very popular? It's so popular that just two years ago, more Chinese went to Paris than went to the United States, the entire country. Now, should we be worried about that? Um, I spent quite a bit of time looking at the Chinese um, mentality here. Um, this is a very young industry for them as well. In 1980, when he just assumed power, Deng Xiaoping gave a rather hidden series of lectures to his government about the importance of tourism. I was shocked to find this, 1980. He, he said for two reasons, no, excuse me, three reasons. The first was obviously economic. He saw it from China, that this was gonna be an economic force in the 21st century. He said for, public diplomacy. China's reputation was such that if you treated people well, brought them to your country, you turn them into diplomats. 